If I were to present you with a country that took part in the inaugural World Cup, their best performance at the World Cup was reaching the quarterfinals after knocking out Argentina. They also reached the quarterfinals of the Euros, coming out of a group containing Germany, Portugal and England. And their club sides have reached the finals of the Champions League and Europa League, winning the European Cup on one occasion. Players from this country have played for the likes of Barcelona and Real Madrid, and one of their managers even coached the total football side of Ajax. Which country would come to mind? Belgium, Switzerland, Austria, or maybe Yugoslavia, or one of its successor countries? Nope, you are wrong. It is in fact Romania. And what follows is a quick trip down memory lane, examining the many highs and recent lows experienced by the sport in this wonderful country. As the 20th century rolled around, football was increasing its appeal across the continent, with Romania being no exception. Popularized by English and American workers contracted primarily in the country's oil industry, one of the first club sides founded was United Ploiești in 1909. A few decades separating them from the more esteemed sides also called United in England. In the following decades, regional championships gave the country the best teams, which faced off in a playoff to decide the champions. Later, this model was dropped in favor of a cup system. After the First World War, not only did Romania grow in landmass, but its appetite for football also grew as well. The interwar years are still seen by some as a golden age of the country, where Romania reached its largest size with a royal house that had ties to other esteemed European royal dynasties. Romania became no longer an afterthought, but a serious player on the European stage. In terms of playing football, the first game of the newly founded Romanian national team was a success, winning 2-1 against the Yugoslavs in their own capital Belgrade. With the formation of the new World Cup, whilst more established European sides declined the invitation, Romania alongside Belgium, France and Yugoslavia travelled to Uruguay. The team also started their World Cup story with a win 3-1 against Peru. Sadly, they were no match for eventual winners Uruguay, losing the following game 4-0. At the next two World Cups, the team was eliminated in the first round by Czechoslovakia in 1934 and Cuba in 1938, which was seen as a major upset at the time. With their three consecutive participation in the first three editions, Romania joined Brazil, France and Belgium as the only four national teams to take part in all of the World Cup tournaments at the time. On the internal front, the league saw the rise of teams from the newly acquired Transylvania region, with Timisoara be becoming a footballing powerhouse alongside the capital Bucharest. The future was looking bright, and surely the world had learned its lessons from the Great War, and no such calamities will ever occur once again. As the 1930s were ending, sports and the communion between nations it was supposed to bring gave way to radical political movements and the earliest forms of sports washing. An insane Austrian with a silly moustache and a fat man from Italy used the World Cup and the Olympics as propaganda machines and what followed were death and destruction on a scale never seen before. No Christmas truces and football matches in no man's land, just devastation. In Romania, the rise of fascism ensured the country entered on the losing side of the war, later joining the Allies as the outcome became more and more obvious. The king was briefly reinstated, but Joseph Stalin had other plans. The man had paid for all of Eastern Europe with the blood of his soldiers and wanted what was promised to him at the Yalta conference. Thus sport and football in particular became part of the state apparatus. It was seen both as a means of improving the nation's prestige and as a means for ordinary people to gain fame and upward mobility in a closed society. The period from 1945 to 1970 was a period of transition from a liberalized form of sport to a state-owned one. The clubs that had been until then the main competitors internally gave way to state-owned clubs assigned to branches like the police or the armed forces, or clubs based around the country's industries. At first, this did not translate to success, as Romanian clubs were regularly eliminated from the European competitions in the first rounds and the national team did not qualify for the World Cup and the Euros. During the late 60s and early 70s, a new wave of strikers appeared that dazzled on the internal and external stage. Most notably among those was Nikolai Dobrin, making his debut at only 14. He and his team Argis Pitesht stunned the world, beating Real Madrid at home, which prompted Santiago Bernabeu to lodge a bid for him. As all the clubs were technically state-owned, the decision came to the head honcho himself, Nikolai Ceausescu. Bernabeu begged and pleaded, offering around $2 million and a new floodlight system, but the dictator did not want to sell his most prized asset to a club that had links with Franco. The 1970s brought a new upward trajectory to the Romanian national team, 
qualifying for the 1970 World Cup. Drawn in a tough group, they lost to England and won against Czechoslovakia, lining up a decider against Pele's Brazil. Brazil's magic was partially neutralized by the Romanians, managing to pull back the score to 2-1, but in the end a 3-2 performance saw the Brazilians go through. After that, a dry spell followed, with the national team appearing at a major tournament only in 1984 for the Euros and 1990 for the World Cup. The internal championship saw the rise of teams like Dinamo Bucharest, Steaua Bucharest and Universitatea Craiova. Despite having the likes of Dudu Georgescu, a two-time European Golden Shoe winner, Romanian teams did not see much success in the European club competitions. From the 1980s onward, Romanian football saw arguably its greatest success. First came the club sides, which gradually climbed the ladder of the European Cup. In 1982, Universitatea Craiova reached the quarterfinals, in 1984 Dinamo reached the semi-finals, and then came Steaua. The team that not many people outside of Romania had heard of stunned Barcelona, winning the European Cup against them in Seville in 1986, followed by another semi-final in 88 and another final in 1989. As for the national team, it took a little longer to get going. The 1984 Euros was the first major tournament of the side after long absence. Drawn in a group with Spain, Germany and Portugal, they only managed a draw against Spain. The new decade of the 90s began with Romania at the World Cup, with an entirely domestic-based football team. Communism had just fallen and everybody wanted to show what they could do on the international stage. The first World Cup group stage after long absence went brilliantly. Winning against the Soviets, they fell victim to Roger Mela's Cameroon before holding on to a draw against Argentina. In the next round, Jack Charlton's Ireland went through on penalties. Arguably the finest hour of Romanian football on the international stage came in 1994. The world was introduced to brilliant players like Gheorghe Hagi and Elia Dumitrescu, and the team defeated hosts USA and Colombia to reach the first knockout tie against Argentina. Maradona had been sent home because of his drug abuse, and without him, Argentina succumbed to a 3 2 defeat. Sadly, the fairy tale ended in the quarterfinals against Sweden in a penalty shootout. The millennium ended with Romania taking part in the 1996 Euros and losing all three games, but reaching the round of 16 at the 1998 World Cup, beating England in the groups. The swan song of that generation on the international stage came at the 2000 Euros. There, after drawing with Germany and defeating England again in the group stage, Italy knocked them out in the quarterfinals. The turmoil of the 90s was replaced by optimism and the new millennium, bringing with it a possible admission into the EU and the better chances for everyone. What people failed to realize was that in the years following the collapse of the communist regime, a series of shady individuals gobbled up and divided the country's most profitable assets amongst themselves. Thus, similar to Russia, a new quasi-oligarchical system was born where corruption and nepotism were rife. This of course extended to football. Most major clubs were acquired by people with multiple open court cases and millions of dollars in the bank. Most notorious was the Bekele family, whose members bought the country's most successful club Steaua and represented the country's most talented footballers. These footballers now turned west, like many of their compatriots, in search of a better career. Some fared better like Christian Kivu at Inter, some not so well like Adrian Mutu at Chelsea. As the country experienced some form of wealth and the club owners had funds to pour into the clubs, the level of football stayed somewhat afloat. Romanian teams had some success on the European stage, with Steaua reaching the semi-final of the UEFA Cup in the 05-06 season. From there, it was downhill. The financial crisis and increased scrutiny from the authorities meant that the wannabe mafiosos in charge of Romanian clubs either lost enough money or were convicted. Thus, many historically successful clubs fell on hard times and were declared bankrupt, dissolved, reformed or split between owners and fans. A brief renaissance was experienced in the early 2010s, but any minor success seemed brought about almost by mistake or by sheer dumb luck. Dinamo Bucharest have just been promoted back to the first league after spending some time in the second division and Universitatea Craiova is split between two clubs, each maintaining that they are the true heir. Meanwhile, the country's most successful club, Steaua, is split as well, between FCSB, owned by Giorgio Becali, a notorious anti-Semite homophobe and convicted criminal, and a reformed CSA Steaua Bucharest owned by the army. This absolute nightmare has translated of course to the national team, who managed to qualify for the 2008 Euros and the 2018 Euros. The 2008 tournament saw some of the last great Romanian players almost make it out of a group containing France, Italy and the Netherlands, 
and in 2016, two losses and a draw saw the team sink to new low. However, it would be only a temporary low, since a much bigger one was to come. Meanwhile, the last generations of coaches, scouts and managers formed in the old communist system that still had the ethos of sports integrity is now gone. They were remnants of a system which, albeit faulty, valued excellence and performance without financial interest. Now, apart from Gheorghe Hagi trying to implement a more western approach to club management, anything else is too little, too late. Almost every club is mired in corruption, debt or has their fortunes tied to a criminal waiting for his next conviction. And as the players might still be dreaming to play for Real Madrid, they usually don't cut it abroad and end up choosing the money of the Gulf states. Modern football has had some recent amazing upsets and the future of football is a bright one in my opinion. Whilst the super rich try to treat it like their playground, smaller sides both club and national prove time and time again that they can outsmart the big boys. With a few investments in facilities and data analysis, clubs can scout future stars, discarded or overlooked by super clubs. Similarly, nations that were considered small in footballing terms are finding new success with a more professional and data-driven approach. Meanwhile, Romania keeps on declining as is shown in their most recent FIFA rankings. They currently sit 47th in the world behind the likes of Panama and Costa Rica with an average ranking of 25th throughout their history and the highest ranking of 3rd. Something needs to be done quickly to reverse the fortunes of this once great nation but honestly any signs of improvement are really hard to find at the moment. To those of you who have stayed on until the end thank you so much for watching and if you liked the video consider subscribing to my channel for more content like this. Thank you so much and I will see you next time.